Welcome back, everyone. My name is Gina Watts, and co-hosting this podcast with me is the only, my friend, Andrew McPeak. If you believe that school should be more than just essays and GPAs, if you believe that EQs are as important as IQs, and if you expect amazing things from the next generation, then you, my friend, are in the right place because we believe in that too. Let's go! Hey, hey. (laughs) So let's kick off uh, this episode with a question. If you could choose anyone to be your partner in a high-stakes scavenger hunt. High-stakes scavenger hunt. High-stakes. Like, I wouldn't know what, first of all, you think of when you hear high-stakes. But if you could pick a partner to be with you in a high-stakes scavenger hunt, who would it be and why? Yeah, so high stakes tells me that the re- either the reward is really great or the punishment for not doing it mm-hmm. is really bad. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I thought of, first of all, somebody who's, like, really smart. Mm-hmm. So I'd want somebody like Sherlock Holmes. That's who I first thought of. I love it. Yeah, who can help me work through all the clues and stuff. But I also think I need a hype person who's going to be like, we got this, guys. We got this, guys, you know. And I can't think of a better person than Gina Watts. Hey! So. <laughs> I made the so cut. So me, you, and Sherlock Holmes are going to solve these clues. I made the cut. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. So when I think about this, you know, my mind went to like a famous person. But then I was like, you know, I don't know about you, but I watched Amazing Race. Like I have seen the Amazing Race. Yep. I, so I have. A, Probably not like you have. No, but it's like appointment TV. Got right? it. Like, okay. So I, my husband and Always And my son, my oldest son, always say, Mom, like, you know, we're going to go do Amazing Race. And I'm like, no, because I don't want people to see how we need to interact <laughs> to solve it. Right. So when I think of a high stakes scavenger, I think of like Amazing Race because you need someone who like will push you. Yeah. But also like who will listen. Like you have to be a team. And so I would need I think I could adopt the model that you adopted. I would need like my husband or my oldest to be with me not both but one of them okay (laughs) because they both would be pushing me okay and not listening to me and then i need someone who they would probably listen to i still have to come back on that one i need need a third person yes to like to balance it out but yeah okay because they'd be like just go just go (laughs) just do it and i'll be like i don't think that's right yeah i think we made a wrong turn yep and they'd be like no we're right you need a, the camera. a person who's thoughtful and who is stopping and going, wait, you, here's what we didn't think. Yeah. About. Yeah. So I feel like there's a reason you asked me this question. I always have reasons for asking questions, <laughs> whether you know what that reason is. Or whether we ever arrive to it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, today we're talking about the crucial role that trust plays in schools. And in the same way that you wouldn't let just anyone be your partner in a high stakes scavenger hunt, you would also wouldn't want to just put anyone in front of a group of young people. Yeah, totally. Trust is a foundation upon which successful schools are built, and it fosters an environment where students feel safe, teachers feel valued, and parents feel engaged. Yet establishing and maintaining trust in educational settings is often challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And it probably looks different at every school. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like to kick us off, we need to get a little objective, Yeah, get the data on trust in schools. Yeah. And so you and I might perceive there's a problem, and I think there is, but the question is, does the data support that hypothesis? So you know what that means. It's time for another deep dive with our resident data nerd, Mr. Cam Turner. Thank you, Gina, and what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another data dive. Today, I have a few findings about the impact of trust within our schools. Let's get right into it. Number one, research has shown that high levels of trust among school staff correlate with improved student outcomes. According to the Pew Research Center, a staggering 82% of teachers believe that the overall state of public K-12 education has worsened in the last five years, with only 5% saying that it's improved. The quote-unquote trust gap often results from high rates of leadership churn within our schools. A study by Finnegan and Daly highlighted that nearly 51% of leaders in mid-sized urban school districts left their positions within a four-year period. This turnover rate disrupts not only our relationships, but it erodes the trust within the walls of those buildings, making it difficult for new initiatives to take root and for consistent leadership to be established. And lastly, number three, research shows that family engagement is a critical component of a successful school community. When families are actively involved in their children's education, students not only perform better academically, but socially as well. However, the trust between parents and schools has often been fragile. 
A survey conducted by the Education Trust found that only 43% of parents and 45% of teachers reported that their schools provide clear information to the families about their children's academic progress. Furthermore, 20% of parents felt that they did not have enough opportunities to engage with their child's school, and 15% noted a lack of active communication from the school about these opportunities. So, Gina and Andrew, there's a lot to process here. I'll leave that to you all. Thanks for joining me for another Data Dive. Honestly, that data was even a little worse than I thought. (laughs) Me too. I, like, knew there was a problem, but, yeah, that was shocking in some ways. To me, I think the most interesting finding, though, uh, but I guess not surprising, is the relationship between trust and turnover, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So if I have a new leader every couple of years, how am I ever going to gain enough relational capital to trust a hard decision that leader makes? Like I remember being at a school several years ago and they said, we have had three principals in two years. Wow. It's like, that's a bad track record. Wow. How in the world am I supposed to trust people in that situation? Well, and you, you start to look at it. I had a similar experience when I was in higher ed that we had just, we had a long time leader, like 30 year leader. And then we moved to a a season of kind of often turnover, yeah. right? So when the interview process started for the person who actually has just completed a tenure, <laughs> he, I remember liking him during the interview. And I told him, I said, I said, I like you. And he's like, well, that's a good thing. And I said, no, I'm not ready to. Yeah. Because I was so used to being. I'm afraid you're going to be gone. Yeah. yeah. I'm so used to being disappointed. And I said, either you're super egotistical and like you think you can fix this place mm-hmm. or you might actually you're really could. good. And I am proud to say the latter. That's true. great. But it is. It's a reminder to me that there is a relationship between trust and risk. Yeah. And each year, school leaders are asking teachers to enthusiastically embrace new ideas, uh, changes to policies and procedures, and even adjustments to core elements like curriculum or the school calendar. Those changes are risky for teachers. If your trust isn't established, right, a teacher is unlikely to want to go along. Andrew, you and I have talked about something you've been working on about how trust is formed. You have something you call the six levels of trust. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm going to talk about six levels of trust. There's so many people who have written Mm -hmm. about and studied trust. This is just one way to think about them. But as we are moving from a more what I'll call a shallow trust to a deeper trust, typically that happens because we've done something to create that connection. So I'll apply this to schools all along the way. So I think level one, the most shallow form of trust is what I call an unknown recommendation. Mm -hmm. So this is the equivalent of an online rating on Amazon, you know, four and a half stars on Amazon, or perhaps a recommendation quote on the front of a book, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Somebody you don't know says it's really good. And that can carry some value, Mm -hmm. but not much. Right. Mm -hmm. So if it's buying something for 20 bucks on Amazon, 4.5 stars, that's a good enough reason to buy. Right. Mm -hmm. But if your superintendent stands up and said, hey, we're just hired a new principal because he had over 500 connections on LinkedIn, you would think that guy was crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if all the value or you were making this really big, risky decision and the only thing you would assess was what people you don't know thought about it, then you wouldn't actually have a lot of trust in that decision, if that makes sense. No, it makes so much sense. So level two of trust, I would say, is about association or expertise. This is when we trust somebody because they are affiliated with something else that we trust, right? Mm -hmm. So if you heard that that new hire that came along has a PhD from a prestigious university, Mm -hmm. you would probably create a little trust in your mind, right, without even trying to because that person is associated or has some level of expertise, right? Same thing happens if somebody stands up in front of you and uh, they're introduced as being, this person has been to X number of countries and spoken to this many number of leaders. You would go, oh, well, they must have something great to say, right? All they got to do is make one bad decision or say one thing that you got some question marks about and it's all going to fall apart. So the trust is still pretty shallow in that situation. It's like. You know, when you gave that example, these are so these are so good. I hope you guys, you know, I'm a nerd that takes notes. So I don't know about our audience if if you guys do that. But I think you should be taking notes because this is some good stuff my friend's dropping. But when I think about, you know, the example you gave of like being on stage and and that association or expertise trust, it's important. But to your point, it's important to a point. Yes. And sometimes, you know, we get into this space of consumerism. You know, you talked about the unknown yeah. level before this, but it's like you get we we're, we're we're so consumer oriented. We're so much like, well, so and so said it was good. Yeah. Well, it must be good because they're doing this or it 
seems good, but we don't actually know. Yeah. We make a lot of decisions that way. Yeah. Right? Without realizing oftentimes that we have done mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of a big reason for this is a, a lack of deeper relationships, mm -hmm. the things that we used to have in the past that we have less so now, mm -hmm. as well as us getting most of our information on the Internet. Where right. All we have are the recommendations and mm -hmm. uh, fancy, you know, endorsements of other people. So, right. Yeah. Blue check. Blue check indeed, <laughs> yes. So let it, let me keep us going. Yes. There's six levels here. Level three, so we've talked about one and two. Level three is what I call received or perceived value. So this is when we've directly benefited from someone or something in the past. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we're more likely to buy books from an author whose past books we enjoyed, right? Andrew McPeak. Um, yeah, if, <laughs> if you're so inclined. We're more likely to trust the decisions of a leader who made decisions that benefited us in the past, even if we don't know that leader personally personally, mm -hmm. right? We get calls all the time from people who go, hey, I saw Tim Elmore speak at such and such place. Right. Could I bring him to my event? What they're saying is I received value from that. I've never met him personally, mm -hmm. but I got value from him. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to have him. So the trust is getting a little bit deeper because I had this personal, it's not not personal, personal, but I, I received value from this person, even if I never actually shook their hand. That's good. Level four is what I would call the personal recommendation. Okay. So this is not 4.5 stars online. This is when somebody you know and somebody that you personally trust tells you, I know this person and I trust them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We're more likely to trust a leader if a close personal friend of ours says, hey, I actually used to work for this guy or this girl. I was treated so well, they were incredible, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be way more impactful than the levels that we've talked about so far mm -hmm. because I have a connection with a person who has a connection with that person. Mm -hmm. Level five is when we know them ourselves. So this is the deepest one we've talked about so far. This is the personal relationship. So obviously this is when you've had a personal relationship with somebody and they are asking you to trust them. Ultimately, this is about two things. Time, how long have I known this person, right? So the more time that I've had with them, the deeper that personal relationship is going to be. But it's also about competency, right? The more times I've seen that person uh, make a positive choice, the higher degree of trust I'm likely to have in them. So even in the face of very risky decisions that person might be making, if I have a past history with them right. of, hey, they led me through hard times before, that's probably going to help me a lot. This one is so good and so important. And I know we need to get to level six, but if we could pause it for one second yeah. and, you know, kind of like park the car for a minute. You know, I think sometimes we mistake personal relationship Maybe there's even something like a 4.5 in between, 4 yeah. and 5, of what really is happening when we look at leadership and supervision in our organizations. And what I'm getting at is, is that we think we have personal relationship with those that were are in our charge. But really, we have more of like a another step back yeah. from that. And so sometimes as administrators, we're doing our best. We're making really good decisions in our mind. We're doing everything we can. Maybe we're even communicating with transparency, but we're not at a personal relationship level. Yeah. Yeah. And so that trust that comes out of that personal relationship level, that ideal space, isn't there. Yeah. And we're wondering, like, well, why isn't it there? Because we're really not yeah. at five. We're asking them for level five trust, but we haven't actually done the work. Yeah. Yeah. And it may feel like as I went through this, it's easy to stop here and go, the deepest thing you could possibly have mm -hmm. The deepest form of trust is a personal relationship with somebody else. But I actually think there's a deeper kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. This idea actually was the one that sparked me to even start to work on this, okay? Mm -hmm. I think there's a level six, even beyond just I have known somebody a long time and they proved competent in the past. I think level six is about a history of past challenges, a history of past experiences together. You don't just know that person, but you've actually walked with them through challenging situations or experiences. Maybe you've managed a crisis with another leader, there's an even deeper bond in that case that would extend beyond the amount of time you spent with somebody else. This is especially true counterintuitively, perhaps, if this person has actually wronged you in the past mm -hmm. and then they sought out forgiveness or reconciliation with you, mm -hmm. I think there's very little as powerful as the bonding agent of a healed hurt, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've been through this challenge before. You sought my forgiveness and I trust you in a way that I couldn't even trust other people. So like think about how bonded we were with those with whom we spent 
most amount of the pandemic with, right? right? right. We went through this shared experience. And what's really interesting is marriage is a really good indicator of this, right? Because I've been married to my wife for coming up on 13 years now. And in 13 years, she and I have a tighter, more trusting relationship than people who I've known much, much longer than that, right? Right. So it's not all about time. It's also about what you've been through Mm -hmm, together. mm -hmm. Um, And if there is a silver lining, and there are probably a couple, honestly, about the pandemic and some of the challenges of the season we've been going through in the world of education, it's it's created opportunities, if they were capitalized on, for deeper trust and deeper bonds to be established. This is so good, Andrew. You're going to have to let us know when this is published. So Maybe we there's can a all, book here. Who I, knows? Feel, I feel like it is. I feel like you already wrote it. You know, <laughs> in all honesty, this is really good. And it is an indicator of why trust has become such a problem in our schools today. Yeah. With all of the, you know, tumult happening around the country with so much changing um, so fast. I try to keep up as you know, just an individual as a professional, but also like thinking about all the other hats I wear as a wife or as a mom. You know, everything is moving so fast yeah. all the time. And then with so much mobility and leadership, many teachers haven't had time to build trust with their leaders or with one another. So true. So true. I think it's exactly correct. And many leaders right now are finding themselves in places where they're making really big decisions. Mm-hmm. And then they're just expecting that they've got enough evidence, quote unquote, to Mm -hmm. convince other leaders to trust them, right? Mm -hmm. But if all you have to have is a degree, like if all you're coming to the table with is I have this degree or so-and-so thinks I'm amazing, right? Mm -hmm. A recommendation from somebody they don't know. It's not going to be enough for Mm -hmm. some of the big asks that we want to make of our teachers. It's almost like our teachers are looking back at us and saying, even if they're not saying it out loud, they're saying this, you know, beneath the surface, show me I can trust you. And then we can talk about making changes. Mm -hmm. Show, then do. That's exactly right. So I think it would be really helpful, Andrew, if, if we get practical. You know, with these levels of trust in mind, I have a few ideas for how school leaders can build more trust with their staff, their faculty, and their students. Some of these ideas, maybe they can even be implemented in a short uh, period of time. Love it. Let's jump in. All right. So idea number one is basically the bedrock of trust. Number one is character and integrity. These two words basically mean that you are the same in every situation, that you always do your best to do the right thing, and that you are open and honest with those who you are leading, even when you have to have a difficult conversation. The best way to find out if you are perceived to have character and integrity is to ask someone on your staff who you know will be honest with you. Ask them their opinion. Ask them to tell you how they perceive your character and your integrity. If there isn't someone who can serve this purpose, an anonymous survey of staff and faculty might do the trick. Give people a chance to share how they feel honestly, and you'll find out how you are perceived as a leader. Mm. You know, for me, I came across a definition of integrity. I countered it in in one of my roles and really have been mentored um, and pastored by some great pastors and leaders. And, And this came from. Uh, Pastor Julia Pickerel, who also has done this work through what's called like spiritual direction. But the point is, is this is where this comes from. What I'm going to say is integrity. It says we do things, not just we do what we say we're going to do, but we do in the manner in which we said we were going to do it. Mm. It's just a little bit deeper. Yeah. Right. So it's not just like showing up. It's not just doing the thing. It's also like I did the thing on time. Yeah, it's not just what, it's how. Yeah, Yeah. it's all of those things. And for me, that's been a very convicting point of my leadership. Mm. And because I tend to always get things done. Yeah. It's just the how that that it happens. And so then I have to own those things and be transparent about it and share, you know, ask for forgiveness and share with people, you know, what happened. So I think that's really important. Yeah, this is huge. This is, as you said, the foundation, right? Mm-hmm. If this is not established, then what else is there? We, you know, there's that famous saying of never trust a skinny chef, you know. <laughs> We've got to practice what we're preaching. Mm-hmm. If we have mm-hmm. any hope mm-hmm. or any expectation that other people are going to want to follow mm-hmm. what we're handing out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would challenge any listener to go, how are you really perceived by your followers? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you need to track somebody down on your campus to find out, I highly recommend that you do. So 
Idea number two is consistent and transparent communication. So regular updates and transparent communication about school policies, student progress, and upcoming events help build trust with parents and staff. This communication should be clear, concise, and accessible to all stakeholders. Friends, I cannot tell you enough how important communication is, Mm. even if it's something that you think is so simple. Like, we're not going to announce that yet because we don't have all of our systems in place. The lack of communication also communicates something. Yes. And people fill in gaps. Just say what is so. Yeah. Just say what is so, so that people can trust you and that they can count on your word. Consistent and transparent communication is number two. And also not being afraid to say the same thing multiple times. If yes. it's important enough, repeat it. I always hear Tim, our founder, make the joke that you don't get married, say I love you once and then let it go. You yes. know, like if something's important, you say it early and you say it often. Anybody that I'm coaching, especially those who are in positions of management or supervision, I always tell them, you tell them what you told them. You remind them that you told them and that you told them twice. And then you tell them what you told them so that you can remember that you told them and that they that they heard it. Like, you just keep going. Yeah. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. And I don't say it the same way every time. But the point is that there's never enough. That's great. Number three is to ensure leadership stability. You know, reducing churn of the leaders on your campus is critical. Schools should focus on retaining leaders who are effective and committed to the school's vision and who are culture builders. Once you identify these leaders, set up specific and ongoing conversations with these people to take their temperature, learn their goals, and ask them how you can help to keep them there for the long call. Listen, Mm -hmm. this isn't a manipulative thing. This is a strategy that's really rooted in career coaching. If you are leading people, you should care about who they are, what their goals are, and who they want to be in various seasons of life and give them permission to change their mind. Yeah. And if they know that they have that permission, if they know they have that space with you, they can trust you. And they usually, if not usually, often choose the school, choose you, choose that community because they know it's safe space to grow. I love that. And I think that's exactly what we're talking about. What we're talking about with trust is are we creating environments where teachers feel trusted? Mm -hmm. They feel like they can have a long tenure here and Mm -hmm. they feel like because people don't quit jobs, people quit managers, Mm -hmm. right? They quit leaders. Mm -hmm. And in this case, what we're recognizing is we want to find those people and invest in them in such a way that they would go, my boss, my leader keeps giving me reasons to stay instead of reasons to go. So good. And number four, it's for all of your other teachers and leaders, the the fourth and final strategy is to focus on building relationships. Schools can foster deeper relationships, which are essential to trust through team building activities, shared planning time, peer mentoring programs, and no agenda connection opportunities. Encouraging collaboration and professional development among teachers is one of the best indicators of trust growth. Now, we don't have time to talk about this today, but friends, I know for some of those things, thinking about budget, you're thinking about we don't have money for this. We don't have time for this. You're thinking about your calendar and it's already full. I'm telling you, some thoughtful, thoughtful whiteboard time can really add tremendous value to the way that you lead and the way that you create space for building trust. And if you feel like, you know, putting together some of these things is not one of your strengths, I guarantee you there's somebody on your campus for whom this is a strength. 100 percent. Tap into that person and go, hey, would you like to take some of the budget and go plan this? They Mm -hmm. would go, oh, my gosh, I couldn't imagine doing anything better. So and then you're doing building trust. You're building a relationship with them, right? So building trust in schools is an ongoing process that requires intentional effort and commitment from all members of the school community. By focusing on transparent communication, leadership stability, and strong relationships, your school can create environments where trust flourishes. As schools work to rebuild trust brick by brick, they lay the foundation for a stronger, more cohesive educational community that benefits everyone administrators, faculty, staff, students, and families. It benefits everyone. Gina. Yeah, buddy. Those were some good ideas. Thanks, friend. Dude, thank you for leading us, for challenging us. I'm thinking there's a few people listening who might feel like they have a little (laughs) bit of a to-do list after today's episode. I mean, it's okay because I also have a to-do list. Yeah, I do too. I mean, we we (laughs) talked a lot. Yeah. But I feel like we gave ourselves a to-do list. People don't realize we are literally taking notes on what each other are saying Mm -hmm. as we're we're recording these podcasts. 100%. Yeah. But in order to capture something important from today's time, I think it's time for a DMI. Yes. 
All right. So DMI, if you have not listened to this podcast, stands for Don't Miss It. This is where Gene and I pull out one thing from today's episode that we want to make sure you do not miss. So, Gina, do you want to kick us off? What's the best thing you heard today? It might even be something that you said today. (laughs) That would be so Gina-like. But I actually picked something that you said and talking about the deepest level of trust in history of past challenges. You know, when I heard you say that, I think immediately of transparency. And you had um, underlined your point by saying there's very little more powerful than the bonding agent of a healed hurt. Mm. And you were talking about how so much good come, so much trust is built and so much good comes out of when we reconcile to one another and when we heal past pains. And so sometimes we think that a relationship's over and it can't be Nothing can come of it. And actually, it might be fertile soil for a lot of trust to to grow. Yeah, your best time in that relationship could be in the future Mm -hmm. rather than the Mm -hmm. past. Yeah. So good. Yeah, you said it. I just repeated it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, well, I got to do something you said. I think you gave a lot of great advice, but I think the one that really resonated with me, because it's such an important issue right now, is building and maintaining leadership stability inside Mm -hmm. of the school. We saw in the data that many teachers are going, it's hard for me to trust anybody in my school because nobody stays long enough for me to learn to trust them, right? Mm -hmm. So as school leaders, if we would take an opportunity, sit down. In fact, I want to challenge people listening to this right now. Write down your top three leaders in your school. One of them might be somebody you hired a month ago, Mm -hmm. right? And you go, that is a special person. I don't know what it is, but that's a special person. Could be somebody that's been in your building for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I want you to write down those top three leaders, whomever they are, whatever age they are, experience, whatever, whatever. And make a plan Mm -hmm. for sitting down with them, investing in them, because you're recognizing that there might be some turnover that happens, but I got to make sure that the people who are doing the best job of building culture here stay and that they're invested in. I think that feels like playing favorites almost, and Mm -hmm. it kind of is, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I heard a great leader, Andy Stanley, say, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone, right? And uh, I think that's what great leaders do is they recognize where the biggest return on their investment is going to come. And that is with those people who are building culture. So I love that advice, Gina. Thank you. And thank you, Andrew, for just leading us out today and like and sharing from your heart this work on thank trust. Thank you for you too. Yeah, this was really good. Teamwork. I love it. Thanks for joining us today on this episode of the School on a Mission podcast. Now, before you hit skip on to your next podcast, we've got that challenge for you. You know the deal. Grab a pen a notebook, a sticky note, or even the back of your hand and write down one action step you're going to take this week. Maybe it's something you're going to do, something you're going to investigate, something you're going to read more about, or a person you want to meet with. Andrew just said, write down three people's names. So take a minute, do the do. You got it? Perfect. Now DM us on Instagram or TikTok and uh, let us know what your action step is. We are excited to hear from you guys. And we want to know that you're listening, you're tuning in, and that you're taking action um, to be a better leader. Until next time, stay curious, stay bold, and keep leading your school on a mission. The School on a Mission podcast is produced by Growing Leaders, a Maxwell leadership company. You can find out more about Growing Leaders at growingleaders.com. We'd like to thank Ed Trust, the American Federation of Teachers, Springer Link, and Pew Research Center for their research that contributed to today's episode. For a list of all sources, check the show notes. This podcast was produced by Angelica Oliver. To find out more about the School on a Mission podcast, head over to schoolonamissionpodcast.com.